Right, hello everybody um, and welcome to this Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation webinar. So, um, moving on, I'm in Cambridge as I mentioned and we have two speakers today, um, Professor Jerry Thomas who is in London and Dr. Sae Ochi who is joining us from Tokyo and I'll just briefly introduce those. Um, so, Professor Thomas is a professor in the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial College London and she specializes in the molecular pathology of cancer. Um, but she's also very active in uh, the question of science communication and feels that it's very important that uh, the public uh, get some understanding of what's going on. And our other speaker, Dr. Sae Ochi, uh, is a lecturer in the Department of Laboratory Medicine at Jikei University School of Medicine in Tokyo. Um, she was also at Imperial College for a period um, studying there. And from 2013, she worked uh, in Fukushima um, and she was also at Suma Central Hospital, which is very close to where the nuclear accident took place. So um, she has a lot of experience of this question of scientific rumors, um, which were certainly rife uh, in relation to the nuclear disaster. And her current speciality is laboratory medicine, uh, which is highly relevant uh, to the question of testing, uh, which is of course very important at the moment. So this is how the timeline is going to run. Uh, that was my introduction. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Ochi, that'll be followed by Dr. Thomas. Uh, and then with the Q&A session, it'll probably last a bit longer than, than one o'clock. It might run on as, as late as 1.15, but we'll see how we go. Okay, so over to you, Dr. Sae Ochi. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, I'd like to thank Daiwa Foundation for giving me such a great opportunity to share, have a discussion with so many people. And today's topic is science misconception and might. And I'm talking about how such misconception occurs based on my own experience. And talking about experience, I'm really glad to be here with Jerry-san because my first dialogue with residents was in Fukushima with Jerry-san. And we hold, uh, had a, sorry. Yes, we, we had a small symposium in a mountain in Fukushima and residents there was, had a really strong food culture. They really love to eat uh, lo local products while they are knowing, they knew that some of the products are contaminated with radioactive substances. So at that symposium, we discussed about whether it is okay to eat local products at our own risk. We didn't reach any conclusion, but it was so impressive discussion. And actually, this was the first time I will took bashing from a weekly magazine. And they say it was brainwashing symposium by experts. But the most important lesson I learned in that symposium was an advice from Jerry-san. This is not the exact words she said, but basically she said it is important to convey messages from scientific perspective in native language rather than in global language like English. So after that, that symposium, I started to convey messages basically in uh, Japanese. And during COVID pandemic, I applied that lesson. I sent a message about concerns of pseudo-positivity and the pseudo-negativity of PCR testing or discrimination caused by te the tests or what is unknowable about COVID-19. And some of these discussions were successful and I feel some, were, uh, some failed. And it's not only me who experienced such dilemma, dilemma. And it seems a universal question among scientists that why is it difficult to communicate some kinds of science with people like vaccination, or genetically modified foods, nuclear power plant, and global warming, etc. 
And many scientists attribute such miscommunication to people's ignorance or emotional reaction. Some may say they people do not understand science and logic, so let's use plain words and visualize our concept. Or others may say people are too emotional to accept scientific facts in crisis situation. So, and sympathy and politeness were the key. And some people even give up communication by saying people's views are biased by interest and ideology. And it's no use talking with such people. I agree some these answers are true to some extent. But all of these answers are the vision about how lay people are viewed by scientists. And few discussions uh, have been made about how scientists are viewed by lay people. And I think there is something attributable to us scientists. And let me show you some examples of gap I experienced in the, uh, Fukushima and Tokyo. After the nuclear power plant accident, I talked much about radiation risk in Fukushima. The incremental radiation exposure in Fukushima was two millisievert per year at maximum. And even adding to this maximum dose to Japanese average radiation exposure level, it is still lower than that people get in European countries. So it is unlikely that this incremental radiation exposure increases cancer in Fukushima. But after I said that, some residents said to me, but neighbors or my family members were diagnosed as cancer after the accident. So I don't understand why you say cancer is not increasing. And during COVID-19 pandemic, I often said, up to now, there is no silver bullet for COVID-19 treatment. And preventive medication may do more harm than good. But some people argued back, but like, there, but there are many reports about successful treatment. Or I know a famous person actually, who actually got preventive medication and he is still in a good health. So I don't understand why you say there is no silver bullet. After discussion, I thought that sound statistics and correct information would reduce anxiety among the residents because they, such information will help people understand risks. But I found that there is a gap between scientists and the residents about what is sound and what is correct. I was often said that why are academic papers more reliable than a person's actual experience? Scientists usually exclude outlier. When we see such scatterplot, we will eliminate this as outlier. Or when we see distribution curve, we see the middle as usual and eliminate the tails. And the case report is very less on than cohort studies. But people, often rely much on personal experience, like my neighbors are diagnosed as cancer. And even more, mass media reports out there, like a girl in Fukushima was diagnosed as cancer. Because dog bites a man, it's not news, but man bites a dog, it's news. But we should remember that, that both are sound information. And another gap lies in the perception of risk. We also discussed about how, whether we can eat wild vegetables and wild meat in Fukushima. Uh, by the way, uh, food on market in Fukushima is not contaminated. But I thought that radiation exposure level we get by eating one portion of wild boar, which is contaminated with 2,000 becquerel per kilogram of cesium, is almost like equivalent to the levels we get by an hour trip by tree plane. But after I told that, some people got mad and said, how dare you encourage people to get cancer? And in a similar way, when we talk about 
preventive actions against COVID-19, I say there are risk trade-offs of preventive actions. For example, wearing masks <laughs> all the time may increase risk of heat attack. Or prohibiting play equipment in the park may deteriorate children's uh, physical and mental development. But after I said so, some tweeted or some said to me that how can you take responsibility if my child is infected? And my preconception was that risk comparison can help people understand risk, uh, risk trade-offs and make it easier for them to accept risks. But in the real world, risk selection is not a question of mathematics. I was said that like I understand statistics, but still I cannot stop reaching zero risk for my child. And on the contrary, others say, I eat products in Fukushima not because they are safe, but because they are tasty. When we make risk comparison, scientists often show balance of risk as measurable. For example, when we talk about risks of staying home, we put risks of going out like radiation exposure or infection on the one side of the balance and put mental stress, lifestyle change or economic burden on the other side. But people in the real life put a lot more on the balance. They put fun and tasty on one side and stigmatization or parental responsibility on the other side instead. So size of the risk are different from person to person and different between scientists and residents. And scientists often miss the perspective that some people pursue fun at all costs. Some people really like bungee jump while knowing the risks. And we, some people love junk foods. And Japanese people pursue tasty food at any cost, I think. We love fugu, a fish, and the ovary of fugu contains really strong poison. Only one milligram is diesel. But somehow, Japanese people make pickles of the ovary of fugu and eat it. But little evidence exists about how to communicate benefits in risk and crisis communication. And as there is no correct answer in risk selection, we should uh, see there is no uh, right choice in risk selection. For example, when we, uh, we talk about whether we can eat contaminated food, we make some comparison. And in Fukushima, some mushroom is, was contaminated with 100,000 becquerel per kilogram of cesium. And eating one pound of this mushroom is equivalent to about 0.9 millisievert of radiation exposure. But this radiation exposure level is less than that we take by a CT scan. But you don't need to eat mushroom. If your children say, I don't like to eat truffle or matsutake, you may be glad because they are really expensive. So eating while knowing the risk of radiation exposure and avoid eating it from fear of radiation, both are reasonable choice. But if you try to persuade or compare others to eat it, it might be against the rule. In the same way, we discuss much about uh, whether we should wear a mask. Of course, you can prevent drop and con contact infection by wearing masks and you may avoid risk of infecting others. But for example, people with respiratory diseases may have a risk of stifling. And there is a risk of heat attack in summer. So wearing a mask while knowing risk of heat attack and not wearing a mask while knowing risk of infecting others. Basically, both are reasonable choice if you know the risks. But if you persuade or compel others to wear masks, it might be against the rule, 
unless a law is enacted. And experts and scientists are not lawyer or not police. So our role is not to show correct answer. By saying so, some people argue back by saying, but infection risk of infection is quite different from that of radiation because we have risk of infecting others. So risk of harming others should be banned totally. But is such risk unique in infection? People drive cars while knowing car risk of car accident and smoking is a risk of secondary smoking and alcohol taking can cause risk of alcohol related violence. And even tweeting or talking in SNS can be harmful to others. So we cannot totally avoid risk of harming others. So there is no correct risk selection in the real world. So in such situation, what is the role of experts? This is my opinion, but the role of experts is to put all possible risks and benefits on the same table. When we talk about staying at home during COVID-19 pandemic, we need to put all the risks and uh, benefits of staying at home. And at the same time, we should show not only quantity risks, but also qualitative aspects of the risks. How much, how, who are vulnerable, or what is it, or how much. Because our aim is not to make people achieve minimum risk, but to help people choose risks based on their own sense of value. But actually, scientists are often the most divided persons. In Fukushima, after the accident, Many academic papers say uh, they polarized things. For example, some say there is nationwide increase in complex congenital heart diseases. And others argued back, there is no data about spatial distribution. Or others say morphological defects in native trees increased. And others say they are just eaten by deer. Or oh, this is a really famous <laughs> academic paper saying that thyroid cancer is increasing in Fukushima. And there is a huge argument about the statistical, uh, it, is, it is not statistically discernible. I don't argue about uh, the, whether this is right or wrong, but after such huge discussion, finally residents said to me, how can we believe scientists when their opinions are always the most divided? I don't think debate is always a bad thing, but such polarization in, among scientists may cause infodemic. In the era of the internet, when people see something uh, they don't know, they start searching. But most of the questions in crisis uh, situation the answer is ambivalent, ambiguous, or unknowable. Like, is living in Fukushima dangerous? Is COVID-19 transmitted in the toilet? Is keeping social distance effective enough to st stop pandemic? It depends on situation. But such engines seldom send back the, uh, the answer like it is ambiguous. They return some seemingly correct answers, which are more ear-pleasing than the um, answer like uh, it's ambiguous. And people, so if the uh, scientists are polarized, people continue searching academic journals until they reach an answer they prefer. And the more ambivalent or ambiguous the answer is, the more likely people reach an unbalanced answer. And how can we avoid such infodemic? We can prevent it only by communicating. So communicate, communicate, communicate is the role of scientists, I think. So in summary, it is not always lack of knowledge or emotional reaction that cause 
that's miscommunication. And risk balances viewed by scientists and residents are sometimes different. And role of, role of scientists is to put all the possible risks and benefits on both sides of the balance. But how can we put all the options on the same table? And how can we encourage people to discuss rather than to search correct answers on the internet? And how can we prevent infodemic while securing freedom of the press? There is no answer yet, but by studying, learning from crisis situation, we may get a clue. So that's why we need crisis communication. Thank you for listening. And uh, I would like to show my sincere condolences for the victims of COVID-19. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Well, that certainly raised lots of issues, which I'm sure we'll be discussing. Um, but before that, let's go on to Professor Jerry Thomas and hear what she has to say. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see this, my screen now. Um, I've been asked to give a short talk on science communication, but first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for in, in the invitation to present this and to talk with Sai, who I have not seen for quite some time but uh, I learned a lot from her when I was in Fukushima with her. My own area of, of uh, interest is related to risk communication around exposure to radiation. So some of the illustrations that I'm gonna show will be drawn from that. But I want to try and give you a more general introduction to the principles of science communication and some ideas of how to put risk and uncertainty into context for your audience. As you've seen from Sai's talk, it is fraught with difficulty, but we'll try. Uh, I'm happy to make the slides available and you'll notice that I've added references on the slides that if you want more details on some of the specific points that are raised, uh, you can go and find those for yourself should you wish to. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. No, I can't advance my slides at the moment. There we go. Okay, we have a problem with science communication in that we all tend to use far too much jargon. Um, and the level, uh, the other problem is we have, we have to judge whether the communicator has adequately judged the level of understanding of the audience and therefore can address the unconscious biases, which we all have, communicators and the audience, that ex exist around the subject that he or she is trying to communicate about. Uh, we've got to articulate somehow the level of and type of uncertainties that exists around the scientific facts that they're trying to communicate about. And it's important to remember that science, along with all sorts of other factors that we take, for example, like our view of history, for example, it evolves with greater understanding. And that at any time point, there will be aspects of what we're discussing that still have more things left to be understood about them. However, it's also important not to talk in such a way that the audience you're talking to is left feeling that you don't know what you're talking about. That isn't going to help anybody. So science communication is not an easy thing to do, as I found out and so has Sai. So there are certain features that become fear factors to the general public. And these are things that are uncontrollable, that have a catastrophic potential, that are fatal or have dreaded consequences, for example, cancer. Um, the, uh, things that also have an inequitable distribution of risks and benefits. So some parts of society will benefit from something, but it will be riskier to another one, for example. Things that aren't well understood are fear factors, things that are novel, and things that require a certain amount of time before you know whether you have been harmed by them. So they're delayed in their manifestation of harm. And you can probably see from that list that radiation fits all of those different points, as does the coronavirus. And one of the things that I've always said when people have asked me what scares me, I'm actually more scared of an infection that we don't have immunity to or the, 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 um, the things to treat it with than I am actually of low dose radiation exposure. And I think we can see some of the fears that are coming out in our societies now around coronavirus. So one of the most important things that you've got to recognize is that who you're talking to may differ in the way that they see the world compared with yourself. 
audiences are heterogeneous with respect to risk perception. We know that, for example, and there's been a lot of studies on this, that there's a difference in the perception of risk by different genders and by different educational levels. And this graph shows the difference between white males, uh, who are the circles on to, to the left of this graph, and um, white females, for example, who are the next line, and also compares non-white males and non-white females. And you can see in general that uh, men perceive things to be less risky, and there's a variety of things on that axis. Um, they perceive all of them to be slightly less risky than, than females. Now, in actual fact, that group of white males is also heterogeneous. The overall score in this graph is actually driven by 30% of the group of white men who perceive risks as to be very, very low. And these are predominantly men of a high level of education who are economically better off and tend to be more right wing in their political beliefs. So that all tends to make people feel more comfortable with risk. So understanding your audience's viewpoint is therefore one of the most important things you can do before you start talking. And this is a, a quote from a friend of mine, Professor Andy, Andy Hamby, who said that you have two ears and you have one mouth for a very good reason. Your two ears are there to make sure you listen before you speak with your one mouth. So you should be listening much more than you are actually speaking. And this brings me on to who is actually doing the communicating. Um, scientists have a deep understanding of their subject, but find communicating the uncertainties around their subject area a, a particular challenge. We are all aware of the holes in our data, and we need to constantly reevaluate the findings that we have in the light of new evidence. That tends to make scientists quite nervous communicators. Trained communicators, and I bring in people who are environmental activists into this, for example, we have George Monbiot, Michael, whoops, sorry, George Monbiot, Michael Schellenberger, Ben Hurd in the Australia, and Mark Linus in the UK here. They tend to be very charismatic. Um, they tend to command their audiences better than scientists, but they're going to need support from scientists to ensure that the facts that they're representing are, can be backed up by a body of scientific evidence. And I've spent a lot of my time since Fukushima happened talking to people that I thought I would never talk to, particularly the green activists, who've actually been very hungry for information and haven't known where to go for the information or who they could go to ask questions uh, about the information that they were seeing. So the most important thing is that the audience trust who is doing the communicating. Who is trusted may be different in different cultures. I was very surprised to be asked to go to Japan in 2011 to talk about the risk from the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Um, I've got loads of colleagues in Japan and I would regard them as being much more knowledgeable about radiation um, than I am. But I was reassured by my Japanese colleagues that a foreign voice and, and possibly in those circumstances a female voice would be better trusted by the population. I'm not sure that you would say the same thing in the UK. So you have to take into account there are cultural differences. And certainly when I was in Japan, I was incredibly nervous and aware of the cultural differences between our two nations. Now, different methods and styles of presentations can be used to convey the facts, but the facts should always stay the same. Scientists can help those who are doing the communicating understand whether the uncertainty is around the actual facts themselves or the underlying scientific hypothesis as a whole. So a good example of this is trying to answer the question, is exposure to radiation safe? So this is a complicated slide, so I'll take my time going through this. So, okay, so this is taken from a, uh, uh, a document that you can get online. It's the restatement by the Oxford Martin School of uh, the health effects of low dose radiation and your references down, down at the bottom here. Um, it shows a combination of different large scale human studies on radiation and the risk of cancer. So the excess relative risk of cancer is here and the doses along the x-axis here. 
Some of the studies have error bars, and you can see this is the, the famous Japanese lifespan study, which is the study into those who were exposed to radiation from the atomic bombs. So the blue circles here are one of our biggest studies that has a very large range of doses. Um, and here you can see that this point here, and here's the error bars there, okay? Now, what that tells you is that a point has been selected within that range encompassed by the error bars um, that represents the risk at that dose. But in reality, the risk could be anywhere between the top and the bottom of these error bars. At high doses, it's really very clear that there is a relationship between risk and the dose of radiation. Both the representative point and the error bars are well above that x-axis. However, when you come to lower doses, around about 500 millisieverts down here, you will can see that you can see it's a lot more confusing. The picture is far less clear. There are points above and below the x-axis, and though, although not all of them on there have actual error bars, um, you can see that many of those error bars actually span the x-axis. This means that a conclusion on the magnitude of the effect can't be drawn. We're uncertain whether our hypothesis that states there is no threshold for an effect of radiation on cancer is true or not. But there is a problem here. Once you have a hypothesis in science, you can only discount that hypothesis if we can produce data that is very significantly different from it. Now, some people suggest that we need a lot more data and that will solve our problem. And in this case, we need many more people exposed. However, if you just take the LSS study, the lifespan study in Japan, and here is a, a pictogram taken from uh, Dr. Duplay's paper of 2011. Each of these single dots on here, which you probably can't see on your screens, is an individual person with an individual dose who's enrolled in that study. Um, so if we look at the amount of data that we have that dictates the points up here with the points in this area from blue study now, only concentrate on the blue dots, you can see here that this area here, let me just click again, oops, this area here encompasses the highest doses and these represent the points here. This actually only comprises 5% of the population in that study. If you go down to the area, um, uh, this area, which I've blown up from the original graph, you can see that 84% of the people are actually in that dose range. So we have much more information on dose, and you can see from the other studies that are also here, we actually have more information down in this area from more people about the likely effect of uh, radiation on cancer risk. But somehow that doesn't give us confidence that actually what we're looking at is possibly low risk and may not even be a risk at all. It's interesting as well that this 5% here of the population, which produces these points, also has a major effect on the gradient of the line and that dictates the calculated excess risk at low doses. So more data is not necessarily going to help us. And to me, the larger numbers represented on the left-hand side of the graph should improve the data quality and reduce the uncertainty. So why can't we know for certain what the risk at low doses is? Well, the answer is probably because we are looking for a needle in a haystack. And the fact that we can't quantify the risk might be telling us that we're worrying about an infinitesimally small risk to health, which if you put into the greater scheme of things, disappear, disappears. So let's concentrate now on a lower dose and looking, look at 100 millisieverts. And this is a number I think many of you will have heard in the press and following Fukushima. Okay, so let's try and explain this in a different way. How you present your data is also important to a lay audience. Many of you will have looked at that last slide and gone, oh God, a graph, I can't cope with this. A pictogram like this one here is generally accepted as being easier to interpret as a, than a graph. 
but scientists love graphs, so we tend to show more graphs. This is a slide that looks at the cancer risk from exposure to 100 millisieverts of radiation. Now, most of us will be exposed to around 2 millisieverts of natural background radiation, as you saw from one of the slides earlier, in the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, etc., per year. So by the age of 50, we will have amassed about 100 millisieverts of exposure. This pictogram illustrates what happens when you expose 100 Americans to an extra 100 millisieverts each. Now, I don't dislike Americans, um, and I don't think there's anything odd about Americans, apart from possibly one American that I can think of, but we use American data because they have very large health databases. Uh, and so large data usually means we're going to be more secure in, in drawing our conclusions. So we would predict, using the line that I showed you on the graph in the previous slide, that only one American, at a dose of 100 millisieverts each, would be uh, likely to develop a radiation-related cancer. Now, I'm interested in cancer as a whole, so what I want to know is how many other people in that group would be likely to get cancer from other factors. And the answer surprises a lot of people. It's actually 42. Now, as we're dealing with a straight line relationship, as you saw from the graph before, as the radiation dose gets lower, the risk reduces. So we'd have to expose 1,000 Americans to 10 millisieverts to find one radiation-induced cancer. And I'd be looking at 420 cancers from other causes in a population of 1,000 Americans. So for me, I'm slightly more worried about what's causing that larger bulk of cancers from other causes. And of course, all of this is only relevant if our hypothesis is correct. If we've got, there, got this wrong and there's a dose below which we cannot be sure there is an effect of radiation on cancer incidence, we may actually be worrying about nothing. And this is a subject of huge debate amongst the scientists. And as Sia said, scientists don't always agree. Another way to express health risks from one source is to put it into uh, context with health risks from other sources. This slide simply puts the risk of developing a radiation-induced cancer from radiation into contact with other health risks and taken, is taken from a paper by Jim Smith, which is well worth reading. You can see here there's a significant increase in mortality from living in a large city like London compared with a smaller city in rural Scotland, say like Inverness. The problem is there aren't as many jobs in Inverness, so most of us tend to live in these, these mega cities. And of course, this is primarily due to greater air pollution and the greater stress of generally living in a, in a, in a compact environment with loads of other human beings. Um, we can also see that living with somebody who smokes is not good. Never mind, you know, smoking itself is not good at all, but living with somebody also has a significant health detriment. Um, and this is due to inhalation uh, of carcinogens present in, in cigarette smoke that you receive through passive smoking. By contrast, the risks um, are lower for those people who were in, involved in clearing up the reactor accident at the Chernobyl accident, the so-called Chernobyl liquidators. Uh, many of these were exposed to at least 10 times more than the general population. So here you have, if that line is correct, and it is a big if, and if the cancer instance we are calculating is correct, it is less likely that you will suffer a health detriment by being a Chernobyl liquidator, not the ones obviously who were there first and got very high doses of radiation, we're talking about those who cleared up after that emergency situation. But you can see it's actually less dangerous to your health than living in London rather than living in Inverness, which it really does surprise people. Another way to look at this is to look at years of life lost. Uh, and this slide, simply expresses what I've just said in a, a slightly different way. Using two key factors that are known to have the most significant effect uh, on years of life loss, that's smoking and obesity, which of course causes a large number of those cancers that we were talking about in the American population that are not due to radiation. Now, interestingly, many people who are survivors of the atomic bomb uh, and that were exposed to um, radiation from it, not those who were killed in the immediate aftermath by very high doses of radiation and the blast injuries, but you would expect them to have quite a serious detriment to their life. But actually, those, even those who were exposed within 1.5 meters of the hypercenter, so that's really the 
even before the inner circle on that uh, graph that uh, Dr. Duplay had in his paper, they suffer an average years of life loss of 2.6. And in fact, because the doses were extremely low to the vast majority of the survivors, the estimate for the entire cohort equates to only four months of life lost. And that will vary hugely, obviously, from those who were closest to the bomb will suffer the biggest detriment. Those who were further away probably won't suffer any de detriment at all. And the point I'd like to make here is that radiation doses from nuclear accidents are much, much lower than, than for those from the atomic bomb. So the risk becomes even lower. Now, why do we care about any of this? Well, it really is important when you're dealing with public health. If we don't communicate properly, you end up with a situation where you have very entertaining, very interesting um, um, films like the HBO series on Chernobyl, which um, has holes in it. I have a friend who has gone through all of this and I can provide the, the, the link to that if anybody's interest, explaining what was wrong about all of it and why things that were presented there never actually happened in real life. You also have books like Manual for Survival by Kate Brown, which came out the same year. But if you allow perpetuation of the myth, you end up with headlines like these, which we saw after Fukushima in Japan, which did a huge amount of damage psychologically to the Japanese population and made people very, very scared of what their future was going to be like. So if the scientific evidence on the real health risks of radiation, and we knew an awful lot about what those risks were likely to be because it was 25 years after the Chernobyl accident, and we already had a lot of data on that, and we had the data from the lifespan study as well. So if you could communicate that properly, the biggest health effect uh, deficit to the population, the mental health effects of the fear of radiation, and with that comes the effects on the e local economy where people weren't able to sell their food because people were scared it was contaminated. That All of that might have been avoided. And it's the one thing that we said after the Chernobyl accident we should learn how to do is to communicate the real health risks of radiation much better. And I, we failed. As a community, the scientific community failed. And when fear becomes a phobia, it has a major impact on society as a whole. So here are a few recommendations, not come from me, but come from the EPA in the States, of do's and don'ts when you want to communicate about science. My top tips from these would be to tell the truth and be prepared to provide the evidence on which you base your statements. So I made the comment that, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, why, if the scientists don't agree, well, how are we going to know what's, what's right? There are scientists and there are scientists. There are those who do properly conducted studies who really understand their subject and are those who jump on the bank bandwagon and do studies that do not have a good scientific model to them. And that causes confusion. So trust is extremely important, probably the most important thing in all of this. Lying simply destroys trust and you won't get that trust back. So always tell the truth. If you can use metaphors and analogies to age understanding, great. And remain calm. It's really difficult when you're faced with somebody who just wants to shout you down and doesn't want to listen to what you've got to say. That you know, you, it is very easy as a human to lose your temper, but that's suicide when you're communicating science. We're all human, but you need to stick to the issue. Don't make personal remarks about anyone who's presenting a different point, viewpoint to your own. Stick to the science always. So there's an art to science communication. Stick to what you know. This was a piece of advice given to me by one of the, the reporters in, in the um, BBC. He said, you'll find loads of people will ask you about loads of different things. Only talk about what you know. So stick to what you know. If you've got a, a, a bigger issue where you actually need to involve more people, consider bringing a multidisciplinary panel together um, especially if that involves a subject area where you're not an expert in. So don't talk about things you don't know. Remain confident and people will trust you. Know your audience and use an appropriate language. I mean, as, as I said, I was really upset that I could not communicate in Japanese. I had to rely on interpreters. If you can have somebody who is speaking the native language, if you're not a native language speaker, 
who understands the science, it is so much better for the population. And use language that your audience can understand. It's so easy to use jargon, and most of us actually forget we're using scientific jargon because that's the sort of language we use all the time because we have a narrow social circle and tend to associate with people who understand our scientific jargon. Check that your audience actually understands you. A lot of the problem around science communication is not actually understanding that they haven't understood what you have said. Ask them what they want to know. It may not be what you think they want to know, but make sure your audience is with you. Use pictograms to explain risks. Don't blind them with graphs. Scientists are very used to looking at graphs. Other people are not. Use a pictogram. One picture is worth a thousand words. And be engaging. A conversation is much better than an academic lecture. And the problem is that most of us are used to giving academic lectures. We're not used to being challenged. We're not used to being engaging. We're not used to saying, hang on, I'll explain it in a different way. You have to get the balance right. You need to express risk clearly, but don't cause alarm. Empowering people to make their own decisions is the best thing that you can do in terms of communicating the science. Fear may also be useful for ensuring compliance with rules for the societal good. And I suspect if we had thought, oh, well, COVID-19 is just another flu, there is no way that people would have actually complied with lockdown rules that were brought in. So fear can be useful for making your society do what you want it to, but you have to get that balance right. If that fear then becomes a phobia, and I think in some instances we're bordering on that in the UK, that will also bring its own health with it. So getting that balance, reiterating exactly what Sai said is critical, and it's really important for the societal good. I'd like to just end with a uh, tweet from somebody who I am in great awe of. He's, he's one of my idols. This is Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter. Um, he is often asked to comment on a load of health uh, papers that come out and define a health risk. Um, and he has a very good way of expressing risk, I find. So this is a comment that he made on the risks of drinking alcohol. And it's all about keeping risks in perspective. To paraphrase his last sentence, which I put in the box there, there's a risk associated with just living, but nobody is going to recommend we abstain from living. A risk-free existence is not possible. And I think if we could get people to understand that, we might be getting somewhere. So how we communicate risk and the science behind those risks is a challenge, a big challenge. But for the greater good of society as a whole, it's not something that we should shy away from. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to wrap it up now because we've run well past one o'clock. Um, but thank you very much to both of our speakers. And thanks to everybody for attending and for all of these wonderful comments and questions we've had in the chat. And I do apologize if we didn't have time to get to yours. All right, so bye bye.